Sunset Overdrive is turning 9 this year, which is insane, because I didn't know it existed until like last year. Full of zombies, different unique weapons, rails to grind on, and plenty of quirky one-liners. Perhaps you would like to join my troop. I'm not wearing a sash. Sunset Overdrive, released in 2014, developed by Insomniac Games, and published by Microsoft Studios exclusively on Xbox until 2018, where a PC port was published. The game was originally made to be a more gritty, realistic zombie survival game, akin to like DayZ. However, this all changed when the team threw around the idea of an awesome apocalypse and turned the game into a playground for the players that's heavily inspired by the future and rock music. To me, Sunset Overdrive feels like if you took Jet Set Radio Future, added zombies, a bunch of that amazing 2014 humor, and threw it into a futuristic downtown LA. Speaking on that futuristic part, Sunset Overdrive takes place in the aptly named Sunset City in the year 2027, after the company the player works for, Fizco, releases a new energy drink that turns people into zombies. Fizco, not wanting the world to know, blocks off Sunset City to completely annihilate it, and it's your job as the player to schmoove around the city, finding survivors, building weapons, and killing bad guys to uncover the plan of mass destruction that Fizco has been hiding. And that's where I come in. I first played this game in June of last year and absolutely fell in love. The movement, the setting, the art style, and that amazing punk rock soundtrack enthralled me in a way a lot of games fall flat in. So ever since then, I've been wanting to replay and make a video detailing all the aspects of the story and gameplay to hopefully get someone as engrossed as I've been. So before we even start playing the game, we're going to make our character and a pretty in-depth character creator. So let my character give her the Renegon, and I'm on my way. We start in a train going through Sunset City as the zombie, well, um, OD apocalypse is just starting. We get off and immediately we have to start running. Square to roll on the ground and X to jump and vault. We get on top of a station and see our apartment and head right over there. We're stopped by a giant OD and are forced to run away. While I'm trying to run away, we run into this guy with a gun. He gets killed and we get my favorite weapon in the game, the flaming compensator. I fight with a big guy and an old man lures him away which lets me head for my apartment and I'm able to start the game. Cracking some beers, we get a flashback to three hours ago, and I learn how this whole OD thing started. We're working as a janitor at this big concert put on by Fizco for the brand new energy drink dubbed Overcharge. It becomes clear that Overcharge is turning people into the OD, and we have to run away from the concert. We then get to change the clothes of our character, and it's a little too in-depth. We have a lot more clothing options throughout the game, but for now, this is the look I'm going with. After some time passes and we're out of beers, the OD bursts into our apartment, but just in time, the old man from last time saved us and helps us again. We learn his name is Walter, and yes, there are Breaking Bad jokes later. He gives us a crowbar and teaches us the basics of melee combat. Press circle over and over and over again. He takes us to a basketball court and gives us our second weapon, the High Fidelity. This weapon shoots vinyl records out at a fast rate, and these shots can actually ricochet between multiple enemies. After I pass Walter's test, he trusts me enough to take me back to his base downtown where we meet two more important characters. Two Hat Jack is pretty much our shop. He sells weapons, ammo, and maps to find collectibles all over the map. We buy the Dirty Harry from him, which is a classic Magnum revolver that pairs nicely with the Flaming Compensator. Finally, we meet up with Floyd, who might be my favorite character in this game. He's really chill and is pretty important, as he makes upgrades for us, called Amps. But more on that in a little bit, because our base is getting raided. The raiders are known as the Scabs, who are one of the three major enemy types in the game. These Scabs are Scab shooters, which have close to perfect accuracy if you're standing still. So we have to move around a ton and take them out. We go back to Floyd, who says that he needs some help preparing the Amps, so we go down to the train tracks to pick them up. On our way, we meet a new type of OD, the Popper. These ones just come up and explode, doing a ton of damage if you're not careful. We get the parts and come back, then the game info dumps on us the mechanics of gun leveling, amps, and the style meter in the most sunset overdrive way. By making your character look schizophrenic. Wow. I mean, if this were a video game, I could just go to a menu or something. Pay attention, player! Uh, why am I hearing disembodied voices? Basically, the more kills you get with the weapon, the more perks it gets, like a bigger clip and more damage. Amps can then be added to yourself and your weapons, this is giving different effects when you roll or bounce or shoot or whatever. Finally, there's the style meter, which is arguably the most important mechanic in the whole game, and being able to master it makes the game a whole lot easier. In short, the more kills you get while grinding, bouncing, and all that stuff starts to fill up your style meter. At level 1 style, your hero amp activates, which is usually a minor buff to some part of your kit. 
At level 2, your weapon amp activates, which range from shocking enemies to spawning exploding teddy bears on them. Your epic amp activates at level 3, which is usually like a major buff. In my case, mine spawns lightning all around me to shock enemies. And lastly, on style level 4... Meaning everything does more damage and stuff has a near 100% chance to activate. However, if you touch the ground or aren't moving around enough, your meter will start to deplete, losing all your amps. And that's like all the tutorial for the game right there. After our schizophrenic episode, we have to go tell Floyd that we're ready to start brewing some amps. But before that, we learned about our subscribe meter and how only 1% of people who watch are subbed. No, that's not Photoshop, that's actually my analytics. Even if you think you are, you might not be subbed, so it's always good to double check. Anyways, back to what we were doing. Brewing amps is a dangerous process, and it involves using a lot of overcharge, which attracts a ton of OD to our base, and we can't let them get next to the vats or else we have to restart the mission entirely. Think of these missions as a tower defense type thing, and we put up various traps around the base to repair and start the brew. After a few minutes of fending off the bats, the big boys, known as the Herkers, start showing up, and we have to deal with a ton of OD at once for about a minute or so. this first brew with relative ease. I always kind of dislike these missions, but it's great for testing new amps and leveling up weapons. The next morning, Floyd tells us that Walter is out on the overpass, creating a flying vehicle that he's going to use to escape Sunset City. We try to help him the best we can, but as we're holding up the new invention, OD starts to charge us, and we're forced to let go, dropping the entire escape plan down the side of the overpass and destroying it entirely. Walter is reasonably pretty mad, so we want to help him rebuild, and Floyd tells us that we might be able to find a new propeller at the Abandoned Factory downtown. Sadly, there is no propeller there. However, we meet another important character, Sam. He's really smart, but has no riz, so we have to help. Wow, that was amazing. Are you like a superhero or something? What? It's just the way you move, the, the things you do. <laughs> We craft a new weapon, the TNT Teddy, which shoots exploding teddy bears and does massive AoE damage. As the OD closes on us, Sam puts his hours and train simulator to work as he piles the train out of the factory with us on top for our grand escape. He takes us back to the Oxford base, which is basically where these spoiled rich kids are staying for safety. He knows with their minds together, they can make us a propeller. Unfortunately, none of them really like Sam, so we have to do a bunch of fest quests to make him like us. And Sam. Guys, I want you to meet my new friend. Shut up, Sam. We get fancy water for this one guy, save another girl's lost robot dog, and finally climb this huge tower to tell this guy that his parents are totally fine. With them on our side, all we need is one more part, and we ask Floyd where we can get a computer processor. He tells us to go check this big tower by our base where Buck National lives. Sorry, <coughs> where Buck National lives. We pull up to Buck National's base, and he threatens us, but after showing him our weapon wheel, he knows we're chill. Yeah, I got guns too. Damn! But how do I know you can use them? I'm an American. I can use a cocky son of a bitch like you. But before he hands the part over that we need, he makes us go on his live stream. Around the map, there are a couple towers that monitor certain areas where we play this mini game known as Book National vs. the Apocalypse. He gives us certain tasks that if we complete them, the better the views the stream gets, which in turn gives us more rewards. I go kill some OD with a train in this one, so that's kind of cool. Aside from this one thing you're forced to do, we never really see Buck again, but if you want to get a high score and get some cool items, you can do a bunch of these. After we give Sam the processor, he starts to 3D print our propeller, yes, this is 2014, and he asks if we'll save him and everyone else. And we try to say no, kinda, but he cuts us off. Hey, if you do find a way out of the city, you'll come back and rescue us, right? Come back? To Sunset City? Why would I- Of course you'll come back and save us. 
I get some more drip from my character, and Floyd lets us know that it's time to brew some more amps, so I head back to the base and start to set up some traps. The OD actually do make it to the vats this time, but there's not too much time left, so it's not too big of a deal, and just like that, another tower defense section down. <laughs> After grabbing the amps, Walter calls us and he seems mad. Hey kid, nice try with the propeller, but you fucked it up. He says he got the propeller from Sam, but we fucked it up, so we have to come look. You looking to steal my glider? No, it wasn't like that. I I'm fucking with you, kid. Can't you see me smiling? Just kidding, he's just fake mad and actually is smiling, see? You can tell. However, he does tell us some scabs found the location are going to attack us, so it's our job to hold him off. Until Fizco has some plans of their own. This is the third enemy type, the Fizco bot, and these ones are rifle bots. They're a pain to try to kill early game as they have armor and take less damage from our weapons. And oh yeah, different weapons have different effectiveness on different enemy types. My favorite, the Flaming Compensator, is great against OD and pretty damn good on scabs, but no pun intended, sucks balls against Fizco bots. Since none of our weapons are over 2 stars in the bots, this is a little tough, but they go down eventually. After beating them, our glider is up and ready to go, and we go into this glider flying minigame, where we go through updrafts to keep our airship afloat. While everything is going good, a Fizco blimp appears, and we need to shoot it down in order to make it out. It drops bombs and balloons at us to try to stop us, but World Time missiles knock them out. Also, Sam does confirm, Reddit is still around in 2027, sadly. I was checking Reddit. Follow the patrol ship! After an intense chase through downtown Sunset City, we're able to pop the Moab just like in BTT6, and we're on the verge of escape until we come across the invisible wall. Good job, kid. Good job. That's right. Fisco installed an invisible roll around Sunset City, and Walter dies while trying to save us. This part really shows our character's true compassion, as as much as we like to mess with him, we really did care about him in the short time we knew him. And this hits Floyd too. However, Floyd knows just a thing to take our mind off of it, and gives us a new objective. Go find this guy named Brill Cream, as he'll help us get out of here once and for all. And with that, Act 1 of the main story is completed. Act 2 starts with us heading down to Little Tokyo, where Bro Cream's scout troop is hiding out in the Japanese Heritage Museum. Now, while this game does have fast travel, I think in the early game it's actually more beneficial to run around and kill things, as not only does it level up your weapons faster, it also gives you badges that we can use to purchase overdrives. But we'll get into that a little later. We sneak into the museum and Bro Cream is nowhere to be found, and we get surrounded by troop members' weapons. The stand-in troop leader, Norton, tells us that Bro Cream is missing, and we really believe him, like seriously. Troopmaster Brill Cream is missing. Well, maybe I can help you find him. Maybe you'll be lucky if I let you live. Kind of a dick, huh? Treason! We call him a dick, and one of the troop members, Forkem, agrees with us, leading her to be banished. She's important later on. Norton tells us the only way to communicate with Brill Cream is a radio signal, which is currently being blocked by Fisco, so we need to go to the radio tower and destroy the transmitters. Once we leave the museum, we unlock my favorite ability in the entire game, the Air Dash. It doesn't seem like much, but sometimes all you need is that little push, and this dash is perfect for that. We dash on over to the radio tower and are stopped by Fisco Blade Bots. Now, these Blade Bots, I would say, are actually the scariest enemy in the game. These fuckers are fast and hit hard. So naturally, I run right past them and start destroying the transmitters before the game can even spawn any more OD. Reaching the top of the tower, we're met with Fizzy, the giant flying Fizco mascot. Now, this is actually my favorite boss fight in the whole game. We have to chain together bounces to disrupt his signal to make him weak to our shots, while dodging heat seeking missiles and lasers that he uses to predict our moves. Unfortunately for me, my weapons aren't really too good for this boss fight, as both the Flaming Compensator and Dirty Harry suck at long range. So I switched to the high fidelity. Sorry, 
After we dispatch a fizzy, we call up Norton, who is definitely not suspicious. Then Sam calls to tell us there's a cute girl at the Oxford base wanting to talk to me. First, I decide that I needed some new guns, so I head over to one of Two Hat Jack's shops to see what I can get. I grab an AK, as it works a lot better on the Fizzco bots than my two main guns right now, and then check out some overdrives. Using the badges that you earn through killing different enemies, grinding, wall running, bouncing, etc., you're able to buy universal buffs to certain aspects of your kit. I buff these sometimes during the game, but I don't really change my main kit too much throughout. I get some health increases, some damage increases to OD and Fizzco bots, along with more style being generated from bouncing and grinding, and finally ammo and damage buffs specifically to single shot weapons, which I do end up maxing out later in the game. We meet up with 4Kim at the Oxford base, and she seems to really like Sam. Comfort 4Kim. Right. Keep up the good work, Sam. She tells us that Brill Cream might be at a hot dog factory, so we go there to look for clues. After finding a few clues, we fight off some scabs and go grab the keys for a wrecking ball. We use the wrecking ball to take out a bunch of OD in this little metagame, and it's pretty fun. We learn Brill Cream was here, but is gone now, so Sam calls us to meet at this diner. He's on the roof for some reason, and tells us that Forkim has been taken by the scabs and that we need to make it up to the train to stop them. When we get there, we're a little too late, and the train starts to take off, leaving us to pursue it on the rails. We have to grind and hop our way closer to closer to the train while shooting bombs and avoiding obstacles. Once we do finally stop it, we learn that 4 Kim have already dealt with her captors. She learned from them that Brokerim was in a trash truck somewhere, so we decided to go to a GPS tower to try to pick up his signal. Also, fun fact, it turns out Sam is omnipresent. Cool, I'm on my way. Wait, how do we communicate with Sam when neither of us is holding a phone? Uh, you know, technology. Technology. Let's not complicate things by poking holes in the way we deliver the story, okay? Oh. Okay, then. Before we do any GPSing, though, Floyd calls us up, telling us that he's made a new base and is ready to go brew some amps for us. I always say this base is pretty sick, but after this amp brewing, we really don't see it again. Anyways, typical brewing stuff. It's pretty easy, only this time having two vats to protect. With some new amps equipped, we head to the radio tower where some Fisco bots are blocking our path, so we promptly take them out and go to the GPS locator thing. We do this GPS tracking from a few different places until we're able to track down the exact truck Bill Cream is in and rush on over there. He's trapped in the back of an on-fire garbage truck and we're forced to use overcharge to put out the flames, which in turn attracts a ton of OD. After chasing down the truck, we open it to see the master survivalist and smartest man in all of Sunset City. Or what's left of him. He's just torso and a head now, but all we really need is his brains, so we pick him up and take him back to this troop headquarters. Get it? The headquarters? After seeing Brill Cream is alive, the troop is relieved, other than Norton. Brill Cream reveals that Norton did this to him and tried to steal the title of troop master. When Norton sees that everyone's ganging up on him, he threatens to drink a can of overcharge, which he does end up doing. Norton turns into a huge dragon and takes Brill Cream in his talons. This leads to another stellar boss fight, where we're chasing Norton down the streets, shooting his back and stabbing him in the head. We even end up using the style meter as a weapon to stab him with. Yeah. 
Once we save Brokeream, we ask how we can escape Sunset City. He gets an idea. Drawing up a plan for a boat with only his neck and mouth, he tells us to take it to his friend Ignatius near the harbor who will build a boat for us. On our way to Ignatius' place, known as the House of Fargarthia, Floyd lets us know that he set up a new base in the harbor. Arriving at House Fargarthia, we have no ideas of the mysteries that await us inside. Thus, ending Act 2. They come from the gutter, they come from the pit. Arriving at Fargarthia, we're almost immediately killed, but barely get away by calling a truce and swearing to be loyal to the king. Call a truce! Or time out! Or whatever! Uh, do you wish to swear fealty to the king? Yeah, fealty! Let's do it! Proceed to the altar. It turns out Fergarthia is actually a society made up of traumatized LARPers who think they're still in medieval times and are hostile to anyone who isn't part of their guild. However, we meet Wendy, who is not involved in this illusion, and she lets us know that Ignatius is sick. In order to get our boat, he'll need to be cured first. Our first mission is an interesting one. We need to go get bark in order to heal up the king, and the only place to get that is some bark at the park. Wendy sets up multiple catapults around the park, one at Fornication Burger instead of Sex Burger, which I find kind of funny, and two others on each side. We have to let our party harvest bark while fighting off hordes of OD that keep getting stronger and stronger. Hey, the bard's tunes are going pretty hard. Uh, well, Wendy's tunes are going pretty hard. I remember this mission being a lot more tedious than it was my first playthrough, but actually, this was kind of fun. After we give the bark to Ignatius, shocker, it doesn't work, and Wendy tells us to go get some more traditional food for him. Now let me introduce to you my least favorite mission in this whole game. Tastes like chicken. So in this mission, we have to cook 500 pigeons using flame traps and the flaming compensator. Well, I mean, you like the flaming compensator, so what's wrong? Well, it's the fact that the pigeons have fucking advanced observation hockey and will fly away if you get anywhere near them, let alone landing on the center of this flame trap. But oh, the flaming compensator isn't enough on its own. Plus, the noise scares away more birds. Anyway, so I bite the bullet and I'm like, fuck it. I'll do a first try. Let's try again, Hunter. Okay. Second try. We must try again, Hunter. Hey, but third time is the charm, and I do actually get it on my third attempt. Fun fact, if it wasn't for this mission and some like various side quests, I would actually have a top 12 speedrun time on speedrun.com. The nations really need some like actual meds, so we agree to head onto the port to steal some from some Fisco trucks. Not before stopping by Two Hat Jack again. He's had a bunch of cool stuff, but for now, I'm gonna stick with my Femming Compensator and Dirty Harry. Arriving at the port, we see three trucks, and shocker, it doesn't matter which one you choose, because it sets off an alarm causing Fisco to send another type of killer robot your way. The Bombot. Bombots by themselves aren't too hard to take care of, but in combination with all the other kinds of bots, they start to overwhelm you. For now though, it's not too bad, and we grab the medicine for Ignatius. As we're about to head back to Fargarthia, Wendy hits us up and tells us to meet her at the park. On the way there, I stop by Two Hat Jack again and spend all my overcharge on a Fisco bot rifle, because it does increased damage to all kinds of Fisco bots. We meet Wendy at the park and she tells us to take off our clothes and get sucked off by leeches. Obviously we're like, oh fuck that. However, we know we have to save Ignatius to get out of here, so we oblige. Not sure if I could show this part, but I guess this is where the underwear customization comes into place. After we're covered in leeches, we down a bunch of Fizco medicine so that it gets into our blood, and then the leeches can suck out the blood, and then we can put those leeches onto Ignatius. As we back to Fargarthia, we trip balls and... Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> anyway, while Ignatius is getting all leached up, fucking <laughs> leached up, <laughs> Floyd is like, yo, go get some security cameras and meet me at the port because we're going to brew some amps on our sick new ship base. The ship base is probably my favorite out of all the bases, and we start to put traps all around the base to prepare tonight's brew like normal. It was pretty easy with all the badges and amps I've gained now, but now, time to head back to Fargarthia. Okay, we're almost done. The king seems alright now, and he tells us that before we can start making our boat, we gotta go beat the guys who took all of their supplies in the first place. And then we say probably my favorite line in the entire game. Sire, that is very fucking unwise. I am the king! Obviously, we agree, and Ignatius asks for his cool helmet, which Lance the Leper has. So now we gotta go find him. Oh, here he is. And, um... They're actually like pretty strong with a lot of health, fast, and do a ton of damage. But we take them out with a bunch of other OD and grab Ignatius and Triceratops head back. And now we're ready to storm the enemy's base located in Wonder Town Land on the pier. We blast through enemies before having to escort this battering ram for a while, defending it from scabs and cannonballs, and honestly, this part's pretty fun. 
once we make it to the entrance, it's time to charge. Oh, shit. Ignatius gets shot. This makes him partially snap out of LARP mode, and we all grab assault weapons. My blood boils. Give me a fucking gun! <laughs> While fighting Fizzy might be my favorite boss, this is definitely a close second with this whole fight taking place on a roller coaster type thing. We have to grind and hop around, avoiding flames and rogue coaster carts while shooting a bunch of shit. Eventually, the King Scab shows his face. Big mistake. As he's taking Nation's Triceratops head and ram it straight into him. Now that all this is settled, Ignatius finally agrees to make our boat for us, and Wendy switches classes once again, becoming our ship's captain. Nothing really big happens here, we just kind of float down Sunset City Canal while making sure our ship's health stays up and shooting OD. We do meet a new type of OD, the Winger, which is probably the most annoying in my opinion, but nonetheless, we reach the invisible wall which took our dear Walter what seems like ages ago. And wouldn't you know, we go right through it. There are the Fizco sensors. Hopefully we'll pass undetected and float away with the rest of the trash. No life forms on board. 100% waste. Okay, I'll take back everything bad I said about Bro Creek. This trash disguise is actually pretty genius. Total garbage. Nothing but trash. Complete rubbish. Unwanted junk. Yeah, we get it! Sam? Help! This co is getting rid of the evidence! What evidence? Us! We're the evidence! As Wendy begins to celebrate, a huge wave of dread rushes over us as we realize we're leaving all our friends to practically die. As much as it sucks, we think about how much everyone's done for us. Sam, Forkim, Brillcream, Floyd, Walter. And we know we have to go back. Need me. Ah, that'll be fine. We just went through hell to get out of there. Why would you want to go back? Before this whole thing started, I just floated through life, never taking anything seriously. Then horror night happened and I know this is going to sound crazy, but my life didn't start until the world came to an end. That's why we're going back. What if I say no? We get Wendy to turn the boat around, and it's time to go save our friends. Turns out Fizco caught Leonard to our plans and are sending hundreds of Fizco bots to Sunset City to eradicate everyone and in turn, everything in it. We skate over to the Japanese Heritage Museum to save Floor Cream, Brill Cream, and the rest of Trooper Shida from some bomb bots and blade bots. Once we clear things up there, we go to call from Sam and head to the Oxford base, where we're introduced to the Fizco Tank Bot. And it's quite tanky, that name don't lie. Sam tells us that he's getting weird readings of an imminent threat coming from Fizco HQ, but he can't figure out what it is. So we decide to enlist the help of the most powerful faction in Sunset City, Las Catrinas, as they're the only ones who know how to get in. We arrive at their base and get our shit rocked. Las Catrinas is a group of Mexican Day of the Dead nurse ninja cheerleaders because this is 2014. Problem is, they don't really like visitors as they're running a sort of hospital for sick children, but we really need their help. So our next mission is literally titled, Get Las Catrinas to Like You. Our hero is really smart and deduces that kids like cool things. So what's cool to a kid in 2014? A nuclear powered samurai sword. We head down to some Fizco bigwig's office to steal a sword, but it's missing. So instead we take all of his awards and Wendy tells us that we can use them to make a sword. We head to the Sunset City nuclear power plant and put the materials onto one of the big reactors. Clearing the area of OD, we're able to grind at the top of the plant and activate it by slamming it down with a hammer repeatedly. And just like that, we have a nuclear sword. Winnie seems really shocked that it worked and tells us to head to the water treatment plant to cool it off. We casually pick up the molten sword and destroy everything in our path.
We go back to the Las Katrinas hideout and decide that it needs some Robo Souls. So we taunt Fizco and they send 99 Fizco bots our way, which we one shot each and every one of them. With our epic sword all powered up, we take it to Esperanza, the leader of Las Catrinas, and we show her the many uses of a nuclear sword. Charms! So many uses! No thanks. Now scram! She hits us so hard that not only does it kill us and make us respawn, but also removes all of the cool powers of our sword. So it's just like any other melee weapon now. We go back upstairs after talking to Floyd, and we ask this poor cancer ridden child, what would be cool as fuck? I never got to see a rock concert. What? That's no way to live. Every kid needs to rock. You want a show? I'll give you a show. What do you mean? You're gonna get the rock show of a lifetime. Are you serious? I don't kid around about. After some chatting, we gotta agree on a huge rock concert just for the kids, because that's what this whole game is about. But first, we gotta get the band back together. Starting with Wendy, who could play the bass. Four Crim on dr Four Crim? Yo, we got Four Crip on drums. Four Kim on drums. We don't have a guitarist or lead singer. However, we see a poster for the band The Melvins, which is a real rock band, and their lead singer King Buzzo makes a grand guest appearance and agrees to help us with our concert. Floyd, perfectly on time as always, tells us he made a new bass near our location, and that's where he'll host the concert while brewing some amps. As always, we set up some traps and then talk to Floyd to get this party started. As it's starting, we learn the kid didn't actually have cancer, and he just lied to us for a rock show. Nonetheless, the show goes on. If Yoti attack those fuse boxes, it's going to ruin the concert. Don't make my kids sad, or I'll make you dead. This is probably the most difficult tower defense section, and I actually lost a VAT. I just kept running out of ammo, and the VATs were spaced too far apart. Regardless, the show finished, and King Buzzo opens his parasol and glides into space. With that over, we enter the final missions of the game. Sam calls us all over to the overpass, and together with the help of Sam and the Oxfords, Four Kim and Brill Cream with Troop Bushido, Esperanza with Las Catrinas, Ignatius with Vargarthia, and uh, Buck National for some reason, we plan our all out attack on Fizco HQ. Fisco knew we were coming. We have to fight waves and on waves of Fisco bots before Brill Cream shows up in the Gurren Lagan to clear everyone out. Sam has the idea that if we can't find where in the building the weapon is, why don't we just blow up the whole fucking building? So we jump between some rooftops before fighting this huge bottle of overcharge, hitting it enough to get the carbonation going, and BOOM! It shoots right into the side of Fisco HQ, successfully destroying the tower. <laughs> but not without a tragic casualty. The player, our hero, gets buried in debris from the explosion, and we get this really heartwarming scene of everyone we met along the way just saying their goodbyes. I just lost the best friend I've ever had. We all lost a friend. And the world lost a hero. A hero that will live on, in this city, and in our hearts, forever. Credits start to roll, and that's it. Sunset Overdrive. That's the ending? Are you serious? Uh, whose idea was that? Yours? Or yours? Bad move, guys. Neogaf is gonna eat you alive. You know what? I deserve a better ending. I got an idea. Okay, rewind! 
Just kidding, our incredibly quirky character makes some riffs and tells us the game isn't over yet. We respawn in front of everyone's eyes, probably scarring them for life. When suddenly from behind us, Fizco HQ begins to move, and it turns out the ultimate weapon wasn't in the building, it was the building all along. Now I get what all this was building up to. Okay, anyways. We chase out of the building while our hero, Floyd, and the building get some of the most 2014 dialogue. And as we vanquish Fizco for good, we immediately have a party. And now that is how you end a game. After the real end credits, we get trailers for the DLC, which I did play on my first playthrough, but I don't really care enough for this video. Part 1 of the DLC involves you going to an oil rig, and Part 2 has you uncover some more lore of Fizco at their bot making facility. I didn't really care enough to play through these, but they're not bad. And yeah, that's Sunset Overdrive. I just love everything about this game, other than that stupid fucking pigeon mission in Act 3, holy shit. Anyway, some people might not find the humor very funny, but at the very least, the movement and just the take on a zombie game is really interesting. I mean, I feel a lot of zombie games, not only just now, but especially in the early 2010s, felt really samey. This was a great breath of fresh air for the formula. I highly recommend picking this up for yourself if it ever goes on sale, because it really is a trip through and through. And like I said, I almost got a really good speedrun time. It's not too long in general, my first playthrough taking me only a little over 7 hours, but it doesn't really need to be. It has a story that's really good, and it gets told. That's all it needs to be. I love the art style and graphics for this game, and a game released recently uh, called Hi-Fi Rush, and the first thing I thought when I saw this was, oh look, it's Sunset Overdrive. Oh, maybe I'm just crazy. I'll stop talking now, because I have a fun little montage thing I made for you, and I hope to see you all again very soon. Thanks for watching.
fucking gun! Why? What if I say no? 